took off from Embury, England. Everybody's nervous and excited. We uh, hadn't been in combat before and didn't realize uh, really what we were getting into. I wondered if I was really going to be able to just shoot a person, you know. I always thought I'd be killed. I can tell you that right now. I always assumed I would be killed. We had no idea how it was going to be. And we didn't care. We felt we were so well trained that, hey, we're the best. The 502nd Parachute Infantry Regiment was created in 1942. At the time, the use of airborne forces was still a novel concept. The Germans pioneered the actual use of paratroops in combat in 1940 and 41. And when they landed behind enemy lines, they caused great panic amongst the uh, Allied forces. The 101st Airborne Division was the American answer to the German paratrooper. And the 502nd, distinguished by a heart on its helmet, was the division's original regiment. There was a, a tremendous appeal to being a paratrooper. And being a 502 was even a bigger appeal. It was a challenge, you see. It was something that had never been done before. And so you, you wanted to get into it and be a part of it. Of course, the pay uh, entered into it because it was $50 a month. $50 a month was quite a lot of money. The training was actually different from the rest of the Army because the training was more rugged. We were up at 5.30 in the morning, and they would take you out and tell you, now pour the water out of your canteen. You can't have any water to drink. This is going to be a forced march. I thought I was a tough guy but they break you down physically in parachute school. The training had to be tough, because these were the men who would lead the invasion into France from behind German lines. The Germans had met defeat in 1943 on the Russian front, but still all of Europe was pretty much under German control. The Allies knew that they had to launch an invasion of France if they were ever to get at Germany. As the men of the 502nd made their way across the English Channel, some were able to look down and catch a glimpse of the armada below. All down below, unbelievable. Nobody will ever see that again. Some 6,000 ships all headed for the coast of France. And to say you were nervous would be to understate it considerably. M most of the men were quiet. They'd crack a joke every now and then. Some guys slept, the smoke is smoked. By the time we were told to stand up and hook up, then it became serious. By the last week of May 1944, Allied paratroopers were sequestered in airfields across southern England. Security was tight as they prepared for the invasion. We knew it was coming. We didn't have a sense of how soon it was going to be. We knew what we were there for. We knew every house, every apple orchard, every road, every tree. The paratroopers learned every detail of the operation. And if you don't take care of your part of it, it could fall apart. The 502nd was composed of roughly 2,200 men, with around 450 soldiers making up each of its three main battalions. The overall Allied invasion plan called for the paratroopers to drop into German-occupied Normandy on the Cotentin Peninsula of northern France. Each battalion was given key objectives as part of the invasion plan. The most critical objective was assigned to Lieutenant Colonel Steve Chapuis in his 2nd Battalion. They had to destroy the German artillery battery at St. Martin de Varville. If the invasion was going to succeed, those guns had to be knocked out. The 3rd Battalion, under Lieutenant Colonel Robert Cole, was to back up Chapuy at the artillery battery and then move a half mile northeast to secure two exit causeways coming off of Utah Beach. They not only had to facilitate the uh, seaborne troops coming inland with their vehicles, but they also had to prevent the other end of the causeway from being uh, taken over by German troops. Lieutenant Colonel Patrick Cassidy and the 1st Battalion were to seize a complex of barracks that housed German troops who manned the artillery battery. The soldiers were all stationed in a series of houses 
that became known as the XYZ Complex. And those soldiers had to be killed or captured. Cassidy also had a second objective, just over a mile from the XYZ barracks. He had to secure Foucaville, a small town on the northern flank of the invasion beach. The Allied planners knew that if the 4th Infantry Division was to land at, at Utah Beach and be immediately counterattacked by German tanks or German infantry, that the whole exercise could be a disaster and the invasion might fail. The paratroopers were set to jump the night of June 4th, but bad weather forced General Eisenhower to postpone the invasion. On June 5th, however, weather reports revealed a narrow window of opportunity to make the attack. That day, as the paratroopers were about to board their planes, Eisenhower paid them a visit. It was impressive that uh, our top commander came down to see us off, to boost the morale. I'm in the marshalling area, and there's Ike standing in front of me. And he said, how do you feel? Well, we felt like we could lick the world, and that's exactly what we told him. We're ready. We're going to give them hell. General Eisenhower's air marshal told him that the airborne forces would take 80% casualties. General Eisenhower was making a decision that would involve thousands of lives and possibly the future of the Allied cause. Just before midnight, all of the planes carrying the 101st Airborne Division were in the air. Nearly 500 C-47 aircraft, 6,670 soldiers, a one-hour flight to meet their fate. They approached the Cotentin Peninsula from the west. But just as they reached the coastline, all of their carefully laid plans vanished into the first fog bank. It was very hard to fly in tight formation because they rely on visual contact from each airplane. Within minutes of hitting the coast of Normandy, anti-aircraft fire began exploding all around them. It was scary. The plane was bucking and the pilots started taking evasive action and got out of formation. Some of the pilots changed course. Almost all of them increased their speed. That was the first time those pilots had flown in combat. I was wondering if the plane was going to crash. You see fireworks coming up. A piece of flak hit the plane right where I was standing, went between my legs. Let's get the hell out of here! And all I do is kept hollering and using a few choice words to get out of the plane, get out of the plane. The planes flying out of memory carrying Cassidy's battalion managed to stay on course. But the lead planes carrying the men of Chapuis and Cole out of Greenham Common came under intense fire and took evasive action. As they prepared to make their jump, the men of the 5-0 Deuce had no idea how far off course they were. You had to get out of the plane. You don't stay in the plane on a combat jump. It's just that simple. All I saw was tracers. I didn't see a single person in the air and I felt that every gun in Normandy was shooting at me. Thousands upon thousands of paratroopers descended on the Normandy countryside that night, German fire lighting up the skies all around them. Scattered and off course as they hit the ground, the 101st would be in for a long, hard night. 